Let's start from the top, right? Yes. When I find myself in times of trouble, then whenever it comes to me, speaking in words of wisdom, let it be. So our speaker today is Karen McPheeters. She has a master's in education, retired medical speech language pathologist, singer and songwriter and founder and director of the Aphasia Choir of Vermont. Six years ago, Karen of Milton, a speech language pathologist and singer songwriter, started the first aphasia choir in Vermont. The choir began with 22 members and has grown to 55, and you may have a later number for me, including 27 stroke survivors, one traumatic brain injury survivor, family spouses, UVM students studying communication sciences, a physical therapy assistant, speech language pathologist, and the director herself. Would you please give a good Ollie welcome to Karen McPheeters. Thank you. All right, good morning. Thank you, John, for that kind introduction. Thank you all for coming this morning. I'm happy to see so many familiar faces, not just family, thank you, family, husband. <laughs> but also um, former teachers. Uh, I'm a proud St. Albans native and attended BFA St. Albans and I see my Spanish teacher and my drama coach. And this is just really cool to see familiar faces. So thank you for being here today. So as John mentioned, I am a singer songwriter. I uh, hold my master's degree from UVA um, and I worked for 21 years at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Uh, as a medical speech language pathologist, and I specialized in helping individuals who had suffered strokes or traumatic brain injuries and were experiencing a condition called aphasia, and I'll tell you more about that. And then as John mentioned too, I took my uh, professional pursuits and my avocational interests of singing and my choral background and started an aphasia choir, so I'll tell you more about that as well. All right, so let's begin. I, I um, have saved time at the end of my presentation for questions, but please do ask as we go along if you'd like. So I think I'm gonna hold this, I think. So Swedish historian and poet Olaf von Dahlen, who lived in the 1700s, he is credited with being the first in modern literature to write about a person's capacity to sing after having had a stroke. All right, yeah, yeah. Um, he shared an account of a priest who in his parish, he had a parishioner, a farmer's son, who had suffered a stroke that had rendered him speechless and without language. He could not talk. And yet the priest noticed he could sing all of the previously learned hymns correctly, easily, and fluently. This remarkable phenomenon has been witnessed time and again throughout recent history and has become the target of intense interest, inquiry, research, study. Um, and we'll be talking about that today. So why is it how is it possible that someone can sing and yet not be able to speak? We need to start by talking about the human brain. I've given you a top-down perspective and a side or lateral view. And in the top-down perspective, you can see that there are two halves. Our brains have two hemisphere or halves, a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere and they're joined by what's called the corpus callosum. And it is that band of cerebral fibers that enables the halves of the brain to communicate, to collaborate, okay? All right. Within each hemisphere, there are four lobes. 
the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and occipital lobe. And in each hemisphere, they sort of retain a certain amount of control over certain functions or skills. Okay? All right. So let's start by talking about the left hemisphere and verbal expression, verbal language. Core expressive language functions are localized in the left hemisphere of the brain in right-handed people. The left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. So when we talk about core language functions, we're referring to um, sounds, okay, uh, sounds and words, and then in terms of semantics, the meaning of words, and syntax is the arrangement or the, or the order of words, our rules of grammar, okay? So for most of us, if we are right-handed, we are considered left brain dominant for language, okay? The left frontal lobe, so remember I talked about the four lobes in each hemisphere. In the left hemisphere, the frontal lobe is often referred to as the speech and language area or Broca's area. Why Broca's area? Well, the work of Paul Broca, he's a 19th century, he was a 19th century French neurosurgeon. And it, it was his work that first revealed the connection between language dysfunction and lesions in the left frontal region of the brain. Okay, so that's the area on the graphic. Is the volume okay? Can you all hear me all right? I'll try to stop turning my head so much. Um, stroke and traumatic brain injury, also known as TBI, are common causes of left hemisphere brain damage. Okay? All right. So what is aphasia? So when I talked about the farmer's son at the beginning of the presentation, he was demonstrating aphasia. Aphasia is the partial or total disruption of language skills, which may impact any or all of the following areas. Verbal expression, okay, that's our ability to name items, to find words, to make sentences, to formulate questions, to participate in the back and forth of conversation. Verbal expression. Written expression. Auditory comprehension, which is our ability to understand in order to answer yes-no questions. Our ability to understand and follow directions. And our ability to understand conversation. And reading comprehension. So aphasia is the disruption, impairment, deficiency in any of these areas or all of these areas because of damage to the left hemisphere of the brain. Broca's aphasia, again named after Paul Broca, Broca's aphasia is a common type of non-fluent aphasia. And it's typically characterized by difficulty finding words, also known as anomia, slow labored verbal output, and relatively strong auditory comprehension skills. So individuals with non-fluent aphasia very often understand everything you are saying, but they cannot find the words to express themselves or answer your questions. In profound cases, individuals may lack verbal expression. They may be nonverbal, completely able, unable to speak. So in my career as a medical speech language pathologist, whenever I would first meet a person who had suffered a left hemisphere stroke and had aphasia, I would administer testing batteries. This is something that all speech pathologists do. We administer tests to determine strengths and weaknesses. We assess singing and all levels of word finding, and we also assess what we call connected speech, okay, propositional speech. So this is a, a picture from a testing battery called the Western aphasia battery. And so at this point in my exam, I would present this picture and I would ask the patient, 
Could you please tell me what you see happening in the picture? Please try to use complete sentences if you can. So you and I, you or I, would look at this picture and we might say something along the lines of, I see a family enjoying a picnic on a beautiful day. A little boy is flying a kite while a dog runs beside him. There's a little girl on the lake shore building a sand castle. I see a sailboat in the distance and a man fishing. So that is how you or I would describe this picture. I want to share with you how, oops, I got ahead of myself there. I want to share with you how a woman named Sharon, um, at the age of 59, suffered a large left hemisphere stroke. And this, when I presented the picture to her, this is how she described it. She said, um, dog, um, ball, no, 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 no. Um, Oh, I can't. Uh, nice, nice. Um, I can't. Okay. So I've hopefully given you a sense of um, language and the left hemisphere of the brain. Let's shift gears now, though, and talk about the power of music and the right hemisphere of the brain. I love this quote from Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, he's the Danish author, probably best known for his fairy tales, like The Ugly Duckling. But I love this quote from him, where words fail, music speaks. So, as I mentioned, right, for us right-handers, left brain dominance for language, that means our right hemisphere, the right side of the brain, is more involved in creative pursuits, music, the arts, imagination, those kinds of abilities. So areas in the right hemisphere of the brain are central in mediating music. They facilitate our ability to perceive music, to remember familiar melodies, and to produce songs. So in us, that's largely controlled by the right hemisphere of the brain. So via positron emission topography, PET scans, a research group, Jeffries, Fritz, and Braun, back in 2003, they did a study which confirmed increased right hemisphere activation during singing. So they took a group of people and they said first, speak these lyrics to this familiar song, just read them out loud. And when they did, through the PET scans, they noticed increased activity in the left hemisphere of the brain, which was to be expected. And then they said to the same group, now sing these lyrics to this familiar song. And they all sang, and sure enough, areas in the right hemisphere of the brain became activated. Now, in individuals with non-fluent aphasia due to left hemisphere brain damage, the ability to sing is usually preserved, which makes sense because the right hemisphere has not been damaged or affected by the stroke or the TBI. As you can imagine, and I, I get this question a lot, so if a person cannot speak, but he or she can sing, well then why don't they just sing to communicate? Well, <laughs> good question. And researchers have, in fact, developed a treatment program called melodic intonation therapy. So back in 1973, uh, Robert Sparks, Martin Albert, Nancy Helm, who's now Nancy Helm Estabrooks, developed MIT. Based on their hypothesis that functions associated with the intact right hemisphere of the brain could be exploited for purposes of rehabilitating speech in left brain damaged individuals. So MIT is a hierarchically structured intensive treatment program with strict candidacy requirements that has been shown to produce improvements in the speech of some individuals with moderate to severe non-fluent aphasia, okay? Another research group in 2008, they compared a patient 
following MIT with a control subject. And results showed greater improvement on measures of naming and speech output, as well as greater right hemisphere activation on MRI after MIT. All right. So melodic intonation therapy, MIT, has two unique components. One is the intonation or singing of words, phrases, and simple sentences using a melodic contour that follows the prosody of speech. Prosody is that kind of sing-song nature. Good morning, how are you? Versus the monotone, okay? So intonation of words, and then the second unique component is rhythmic tapping of the left hand with each syllable that serves, at a, serves as a catalyst for fluency, all right? So to give you a sense of stimulus items, an elementary level would be, I love you. An intermediate, intermediate level, I love my children. An advanced level, I love my daughter and my son. And the different levels don't just indicate the length of the stimuli, but also how much the clinician, the therapist, is prompting or cueing or assisting. So it starts with humming, the program starts with humming and progresses through unison singing, unison speaking, repetition, answering questions, to eventually get a person from singing functional phrases and sentences to speaking them. Many people have had success with MIT, including Congresswoman Gabrielle Gabby Giffords, whom many of you have probably heard about. So Gabby developed non-fluent aphasia as a result of a gunshot wound to the left side of her head during an, an assassination attempt in 2011. She was very, very impaired initially, nearly non-verbal initially and her speech and language pathologist initiated MIT. And she did benefit, very in early on in her recovery, she benefited such that she got to the point that traditional speech and language intervention replaced it. Um, so a success story. So I would like to tell you about Steve, and I wanna let you know that any um, images you see people of mine, pictures that I'm presenting, I do have full permission um, from the people you see to use them. So this is Steve, a former patient of mine. He suffered a large left hemisphere stroke in 2009, which resulted in severe non-fluent aphasia. We tried melodic intonation therapy, that's where we started, we tried. Um, ultimately, we had to shift gears and focus on what's called augmentative alternative communication, or AAC. So that is where people use um, speech generating devices, computerized methods, or um, picture icons, printed words and sentences. So we had to shift to AAC. Steve has been a member of the Aphasia Choir of Vermont since 2014, and I'll soon be telling you more about that. But I would like you to hear the difference between Steve trying to communicate himself verbally and Steve singing, okay? And I wanna apologize in advance for the videography, but you'll still get a good, a good sense. Okay, so, hi Steve. <laughs> Recently, did you have a good time? <laughs> I'm behind here. <laughs> so, did you have a good time at the wedding? Uh, what? Did you have a good time at the wedding? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, but yeah. 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 Were there a lot of people there? Uh, yeah. Wow. Um. Five 
hundred people? Yeah. Wow. Did you have to travel out of state for this? Yeah. Get all dressed up and all that? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, how are you feeling today? No. Yeah. Ooh, we... You're getting over a little cold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Chris is out of town right now? What? Chris is out of town right now? Oh, yes. Yeah. Work, yeah. Working somewhere? Uh, 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 in Atlanta. Atlanta. Oh. Ah. Yeah. I forget uh, what he does. Is he a carpenter? No. Um, uh, You see how generate language. Um, he's reliant on me to drive the exchange by asking yes no questions and by my observing his gestures, his facial expressions, um, his attempts to write and to draw number, write numbers in the air. Um, and you'll notice that he was going ooey, ooey, ooey. Oftentimes, individuals with severe to profound aphasia, there is that natural instinct to want to produce something. Um, for some individuals, it, for some individuals, it's okay, 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 or yes, 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 yes. For Steve, it's ooey, 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 ooey. Okay. So, What I want you to see now, though, or hear now, is the difference when I ask Steve to sing. And again, my apologies for my camera work on this. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Excellent, beautiful, beautiful. Now, if you want to put your glasses on, we'll sing a little bit of Let It Be. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Okay. Um, do you want the music or just me? How about just me? Me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ready? Yeah. When I found myself in times of trouble, a memory comes to me. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. Let it be. Uh, what's that second verse? Oh. We? Let's try that again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start from the top, right? Yes. When I find myself in troubles of trouble, then memory comes to me. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. Sing on. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Was that because he was trying to read them off the page, or, or did his word retrieval wasn't working at that, at that time in his, re, in his recovery? My sense was that because his aphasia was so profound, he could sing, but it just wasn't perfect. So I think, yeah. And I, in Steve's case, looking at the lyrics was often helpful to him 
not so much with, with other individuals, but in fact, when, I, when we developed a communication device for him, a lot of it was word and phrase and sentence based. But um, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'd like to tell you about the aphasia choir of Vermont. Throughout my career, I had been evaluating numerous individuals who had suffer, suffered left hemisphere brain damage and could not speak or had trouble speaking, but could sing, because we always assess for singing. So time and again. So in 2013, I got to thinking. And I said to myself, why not get these individuals together and form a choir? Hmm. Why not start a choir? And I thought, why not focus on what these individuals with aphasia can do versus what they can't? In their daily lives, they were constantly confronted with limitation, struggle, and difficulty. And I said, let's focus on ease, fluency, and expression. And I also, throughout my career, noticed how individuals with aphasia often suffered from depression and became socially isolated after their strokes. Many lost friendships, some lost marriages, because of this communication barrier, okay? So I thought, not only can we get together and have this experience of ease of expression, but let's also, let's create this environment where they can have fun, have social interaction, and experience a sense of belonging knowing they are not alone. I also thought, let's kind of promote a sense of purpose by preparing for and performing a public concert. Because throughout my uh, days in, in choirs, it was always about getting ready for the concert. And I thought, let's have a sense of purpose. Let's have a goal, all right? And I also thought that an aphasia choir could be an important vehicle for public education about aphasia. So we adopted, I adopted this little motto, um, where words fail, I borrowed it obviously from Hans Christian Andersen, where words fail, music speaks. That's our little logo that we wear on our aphasia choir t-shirts. And so it began. I started dreaming, 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 planning, trying to figure it out, 2012, 2013. Then I said, okay, 2014, Let's go for it. And we started with 11 stroke survivors with moderate to profound non-fluent aphasia. And we included their spouses and caregivers, uh, UVMMC volunteers, so hospital uh, employees, rehabilitation specialists, and UVM students studying speech language pathology. I identified familiar, easy to sing pop songs and I crafted simplified arrangements. We rehearsed weekly from mid-March to early June, and then performed a free public concert uh, to a standing room only crowd of 175 people. And the reason I chose June is because June is National Aphasia Awareness Month. Okay, So that's how we started. And I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know would it work. Well, we grew. And since then, up until the pandemic, we had to cancel in 2020 and 2021, unfortunately. But up until then, the program continued annually with financial support from the UVM Medical Center Auxiliary and private donors. Uh, membership has grown to include 25 stroke survivors and one traumatic brain injury survivor from Chittenden County and the surrounding areas. And then again, the number increases exponentially when we include those spouses, caregivers, supporters, UVM students. Um, I will tell you that we have members that travel as far away as Rutland, Callis, Northfield, but the majority of members come from Chittenden County. I have yet to recruit or have anybody from Franklin County join us, um, so I hope you will keep Keep me and keep the choir in mind if you know of anybody who might be interested in joining. Our audiences have grown every year with attendance at approximately 580 people in a 600 seat capacity space at Colchester High School in 2019. And the choir has received positive attention via a national magazine, 
as well as local newspapers, radio stations, and television. And in early 2020, the Aphasia Choir of Vermont uh, won the Stroke Hero Award for Outstanding Group by the, um, uh, the American Stroke Association. Chose us and, and honored us with that. So. so this is us at our the last concert that we gave in 2019 at Colchester High School. You can see the uh, stroke and traumatic brain injury survivors seated in front, and their supporters and UVM students and hospital volunteers are standing behind them. So, with our matching T-shirts. <laughs> I thought you'd be interested in hearing a little clip from one of our rehearsals. This is from 2016. I thought you'd be interested in getting a sense of the types of songs that we perform. They are mostly from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but we have done some from the 30s and 40s and some more current. Um, the Beatles are a big favorite every year. Choir members say, Beatles! So we do a lot of the Beatles. Um, but we've got some old standards um, like Over the Rainbow and What a Wonderful World. Um, some country tunes. Sweet Caroline is also a big favorite, Sweet Caroline. And we have so much fun. That is our primary goal, is to have fun. We have so much fun, and everyone is so lighthearted that during every concert, we identify at least one song where we can dress up in costume, like throw a boa around the neck while we're singing Hello, Dolly. Um, and we incorporate kazoos at least once or twice. So I'm. Sweet Caroline, you know, sweet Caroline. Ring, ring, ring. So we have an awful lot of fun together. We have missed each other greatly in the past two years, but we were able to uh, convene for a reunion last summer uh, in an outdoor space, and that was just so nice to see everybody. Yes, John? Good question. Yes, we have one year we had, to, I'm going to blank on the song, but there was an opportunity for a few select people to, uh, to sing along for a moment or two. And Steve, the man you saw in the video, um, we, one year we did, um, Good night, sweetheart, well, it's time to go. And Steve did the do-do-do-do-do. <laughs> so, so not only is it amazing to work with these inspiring individuals and to see how much easier it is for them to express themselves in the song. But I also noticed there were other benefits, other benefits. I did notice improved moods and greater social interaction as rehearsals progressed. During our very first rehearsal in 2014, as we waited for the rehearsal to start, you could have heard a pin drop. And now, it is so loud. There is so much going on, so much communication effort and success and that I have to you know, get the like, Ooh, you know, to get everybody's attention. So that's been really neat. Early, at, very early on, I'm thinking of one man in particular who was suffering from severe depression um, because of his stroke and his aphasia that he didn't even want to get out of bed. And this man is a different person now. He is all joy and laughter and fun. And so I, I have definitely seen benefits in those areas. We've also noticed or, or have had reports from spouses. They've told me that their, their loved ones have demonstrated improved verbal expression following the program. I mean, I do, it is exercise for the brain. Um, it is, there's some bi-hemispheric bi activity happening. So it doesn't surprise me that at the end of a two and a half month program like this, where there's a lot of socialization and singing, that a person would have an easier time with, with communication. Um, so that's, that's been a nice benefit. 
improved family relationships. I mentioned earlier about um, that some couples face divorce because of these communication barriers. And um, after our very first concert in 2014, a, a young man approached me with tears in his eyes. And his parents had been really struggling. His father had had a severe stroke, had severe aphasia. His mother had to take on all of the caregiving duties and household management. It was causing them a great deal of stress. But he came up to me and he said, I want to thank you. Thanks to the choir, my parents are laughing in the kitchen again. And I thought, oh, wow, wow. And another anecdotal benefit for some, they've been able to reconnect with their former passions and talents. It is not a requirement. You do not need to be able to sing or read music to be a member of the choir. Um, but in fact, most members of the choir aren't singers. They might be shower singers, but they wouldn't identify themselves as singers. But yet, some are. Um, we've had people who sang in choirs in their own high school days. Um, one of our members uh, used to be the director of the music program at Bennington College. So for some, there, and in fact, this man um, is directing some of our songs. Um, so for some, they've been able to connect with their former passions and talents. Also, one other little example I'll give is a man named Chris, who prior to his stroke, uh, played the guitar. But because of his stroke, the right side of his body became paralyzed. But he could still form the chords in his left hand on the fretboard. So his brother, who was a mechanical engineer, developed a foot pedal system so that it would strum for him and he could just change the chords. And so Chris plays along during choir concerts on at least one of the songs, and he does play on his own now as well. So another, another benefit. And fun is had by all. As I mentioned, on the right you'll see a woman named Cheryl. Cheryl suffered a large uh, left hemisphere stroke uh, in her 50s. Um, she was left with profound aphasia. She is nonverbal, she is unable to speak, and she is wheelchair bound, but she can sing. Not perfectly, not perfectly, but she can sing. Uh, on the left is one of our UVM students uh, named Amanda back in 2016. Fun, fun, fun. So when I hatched this idea, my first thought was, is anybody else doing this? So I did a Google search, and I found a choir in Texas, associated with the university there, and in California, also associated with the university. But these were metropolitan areas. So I did reach out, got some guidance and suggestions, and kind of came up with my own model for our rural state. Um, and as I mentioned, we got some media, after that first concert, we got some media attention in a national speech language pathology magazine. And after, since then, after that, many speech pathologists from around the country reached out to me to say, hey, great idea, how do we do it? And so I've offered song ideas, uh, lyrical arrangements, fundraising uh, ideas, you know, answered questions. And so now there are choirs formulating, forming all over the country. We've got, there's one in Boston now, in the Midwest, and several in New England, and there are choirs abroad as well. I did, when I first started, there was uh, a couple in Holland, one in Africa, um, and since then, it's, uh, choirs are growing there as well. Last year, a woman from New Zealand reached out to me, a neurologic music therapist from New Zealand, wanting advice about how to start a choir. So it's just been a, a wonderful thing. The world, obviously, we need more of these. They work, they help, they benefit. And in fact, a study of choir participation in Australia showed clear benefits for individuals with aphasia who had been experiencing depression and loneliness. So they took uh, 13 choir participants with aphasia and they, at the start of the program, they measured through interview, various instruments and surveys, mood, um, social engagement, communication, various areas. They measured it at the start of the choir program and then at a 12-week interval 
and a 20-week interval, and it showed remarkable gains in a sense of peer support, uh, social, uh, social connection, mood, um, motivation, express, communication, expression. So clear, clear benefits um, have been shown, which makes a great deal of sense. So I mentioned that one of our goals in our choir program is to educate the public about aphasia. And we do that through an information table with pamphlets and brochures, but also we offer this information throughout the choir concert. Um, and this comes from the members of the aphasia choir. I you know, put it all together, but this, these are their sentiments. And I thought I would share them with you today um, because perhaps you know someone with aphasia or maybe you don't. Um, but this information might be helpful. So we come from all walks of life. Our strokes didn't affect our intelligence. You don't need to talk loudly when interacting with us. Please don't leave us out of conversations. It takes time and effort for us to communicate, so please listen closely and be patient. When we can't say what we're thinking, we may find other ways to express ourselves such as writing or using gestures. Please look at us and address us instead of our spouses or care caregivers. It helps us if you don't talk too fast. You can ask us yes and no questions if you're having trouble understanding us or want to help us get our messages across. So I mentioned that the choir has been on hiatus these past two years because of the pandemic. And it is my sincerest hope and my greatest goal to reconvene the choir this spring. I'm currently dreaming up, scheming up ideas and ways for us to get back together again in a safe way. And my hope is that we can have a public outdoor concert uh, in mid to late June. So if you would like to stay informed about when the aphasia choir is performing, I would welcome you to put your name and email or snail mail address on the sign-up sheet that I have right at this table here. Um, and I also have business cards available with my contact information. So if you know someone with aphasia that you'd like to refer to the choir program or um, please feel free to take one of my business cards. There's also, if, if you're thinking something that you heard about today, you're like, oh, I'd really like to share this with a friend. If you go to my website, www.karenmcfeeders.com, there is a link. It's my music songwriter website, but there is a link about the choir. And um, it talks about the choir, the Stroke Hero Award that we won. Um, so just know that that's there if you'd like to share it or pass it along. Um, these are my references for um, my presentation. And I would thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today. And I would like to welcome your questions. Yes, Louise? You mentioned being right handed. What if you're left handed? <laughs> <laughs> so if you're left <laughs> so if you're left handed, then very often, but not always, you would have a right hemispheric dominance for language. But actually, it's been shown that most lefties are also ambidextrous and are actually perhaps using also the left hemisphere. Um, so regardless of handedness, well, so let me back up for a moment. If a person who is left-handed has a right hemisphere stroke, then it stands to reason they would demonstrate aphasia. Um, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. <laughs> yes, John. I know that a lot of people, a lot of parents, when their children exhibit left-handed, are inclined to try and convert them to be right-handed. They think they're going to be better off during the course of their life. Does that affect anything that you're talking about? No, and, and changing handedness is no longer, 
acceptable. Um, that's very, very much frowned upon um, because it is a natural predisposition. Um, and it is one that is unique to humans, but also in the ape population. And I believe in some bird species, they'll show preference for picking up things with a, their right foot versus their left. Um, so no, it's, it's a natural inclination. And again, both sides of the brain are really participating in all activities, but there's a kind of a predominance or a localization, a primary role. But for you know, a good example, um, if I can tangent for a second, when we think about language being in, kind of in the left hemisphere, actually we use the right hemisphere for prosody and intonation, the pragmatics of communication. So the way that our voice lilts and goes up and down, but also the, the way we use our, our faces and our gestures, and those are the pragmatic language elements of language, and those are mediated by the right hemisphere. Yes? Can you talk about the support people? The support, she's asking about the support people who are members of the choir. So when I started, I felt like it would be important for every choir member to have a partner. Um, and so for those who don't have spouses or caregivers that attend with them, and by the way, all of those support people sing. They are choir members, they perform with us. My husband is a a volunteer and member, yes, he sings. But, um, so they, um, for those who come alone, uh, we partner them up with either a rehab volunteer from the hospital, we, uh, John mentioned we have an occupational therapist, a physical therapy assistant, um, and then also we have the UVM students uh, studying speech pathology, we'll pair them up also with individuals who come alone. And they're, the, the role they serve, um, it could be turning the pages in the lyric binder. It could be using a visual guide to help them track as they look at the lyrics. Um, it could be just the, the act of singing next to them and giving them a little bit of confidence or courage or support vocally. Um, but for me too, I feel like it's important from a socialization standpoint. So I often will try to encourage a student to sit on the other side of someone who comes with a spouse or caregiver so that the survivor has an opportunity to interact with someone new. And I make sure that I have clipboards and dry erase boards available so that the students, if the person is struggling, and very often they do to communicate, the student can grab the dry erase board and say, can you draw that for me? Can you start to write that? Yes. Does sign language ever come into your Does sign language come into? No, not in a traditional sense, but there actually are gestural treatment programs. So like using music to facilitate communication, there are programs that help people learn how to incorporate more gestures to facilitate communication, teaching them to do this when they want something to drink, that sort of thing. Have, have you found um, or, or noticed that people, after singing, their word retrieval comes it comes much easier to them? You know, I have someone that has a real tough time with word retrieval, and I'm just wondering, does it does it help by singing? You know? Yes, and again, I haven't done any formal research studies myself, but I have noticed that, and I I think it probably has something to do with again that sort of likely by hemispheric involvement or just the act of, of stimulating the cortex and the added benefit of, of joy. Like, I don't know about you, but I can't sing and not feel good unless I'm choosing to sing a very sad song. But uh, songwriting is a, is a creative outlet for me and singing is a way that I help myself if my mood is down. So I think it's probably a combination of factors that someone would say I sing and then I can talk more easily or I can find the word more easily. And um, last question. <laughs> uh, I hear mostly unison singing. Do you, have you ever worked with harmonies as well? Yes, we have. <laughs> Great question. So each year I kind of try to build, I mean, we have core members. Don't, I mean, we mentioned, sorry, started with 11 
we're up to 26. Um, and we had a big, big, big growth spurt in 2016, and the majority have stayed. Um, and so I've been always searching for ways to make it more challenging, more interesting, more engaging. So yes, um, last year, in fact, we incorporated harmonies. I had a UVM student who was a singer stand with me, and we'd teach parts, and we'd let them decide, would you like to try to sing the harmony? Do you want to sing the melody? And I would provide education. What does that mean? What's a melody? What's harmony? <coughs> but anyway, yes. And then uh, we did do harmonies during the concert, and that was a lot of fun. I'm trying to remember what song it was. It was a Beatles song. I know for sure it was a Beatles song. <laughs> Let it be. <laughs> <laughs> Good questions. Yes. Um, you, I, mean, I noticed due to the demographic, I assume the songs were from the 50s, 60s era. Do you have any thought or idea of, as people age, how would it work with rap? Or if somebody's huh. a huge Van Hamilton fan? <laughs> <laughs> would yeah, that be as effective as something more melodic? I am guessing no, and that is the reason, well, there's more than one reason I shy away from rap music. But, no, I think it's, in my mind, it's too heavily language-based. It's really, again, the, the melodic contours, the song, the music of it, that enables the ease and the fluency. So um, I don't think rap will ever be a part of our repertoire. <laughs> but, but our youngest member, the age range, uh, currently is 38 to 85. So I do want to be sensitive to the folks on the other end of the spectrum. So last year we did a Rascal Flats tune. Yep. And then in terms of the other end, I want to make sure that every now and then, now and then we do a 30s or 40s song. Um, one of the songs that is on this year's playlist, song list, is um, the way you hold your hand, the way you drink your tea. I think it was um, Elizabeth we know who that is. But, uh, na, 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 oh, they can't take that away from me. I was trying to think of the Gershwin. name of the um, singer. It's Gershwin. Gershwin. Right? Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah. Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald. Yes. Does it have to be a song that's in their memory? Very, very good question. No, it does not. But it is helpful if it's familiar. And that's why every year I try to think of what will be known, what is popular, what has a recurring chorus, because that makes it easier. What has, um, I shy away from story songs with multiple verses where the words change. Like, how can I make it most familiar, easiest, most pleasurable? Um, so that, that plays a role. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Do you um, have any connection with the music groups for Alzheimer's uh, sufferers? I saw something on 60 Minutes, they were actually playing instruments. Mm. Yes, yeah, so music is incredibly powerful and beneficial on so many levels to so many people, so many populations. And yes, there is a program called Music and Memory. Um, that is designed for individuals with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's using digital music, personalized playlists of digital music for the person with dementia or Alzheimer's. And they do notice that when these headsets are placed on these individuals and they hear familiar music, that they, they notice a variety of responses, whether it's increased physical movement, like moving to the rhythm, mm -hmm. to singing along, to waking up, to smiling. So there's great, great benefit um, music with, with that population. Yeah. We, the choir, it's, a, it's an annual program that generally happens in the spring, but every fall, we make it a point to perform again in a smaller context. So we have performed for a Parkinson's disease support group, an Alzheimer's support group. Um, we performed at the state speech language pathology convention. So, um, yeah. 
Other questions? One more question. Do you have any more admin CDs of your own? Um, <laughs> <laughs> not having to do with your patient. Thank you, Denise. I have a $20 bill for you afterwards. <laughs> So in my singing songwriting side of my life, I have put out four CDs. And my most recent one I did because I couldn't do the choir. When I, when I started the choir, that took up kind of all my, my time and energy. But when we couldn't, I had all these songs that I'd written that hadn't been recorded. So I said, OK, now's the time. So I recorded my new CD, Bonfire. It came out in April 2021. And I decided that any money that I made from this project would be donated to the Aphasia Choir. And to date, we've raised almost $1,800. So yes, I, I, through, you can go through my website. I do have a few CDs with me today. But thank you, Denny. <laughs> yes? I was wondering if you've ever tried to do drums like Aula for Jaffa or Blind or any of those types no. of things since childhood. No, I, no, I haven't. I haven't. We've tended to stick with popular music. Um, that would be interesting. That would be an interesting thing to try as sort of like an exercise or something different to do. Thank you for the suggestion. Yes, Linda. Do you have instruments that you use, such as piano, uh, drums, harmonica, that kind of thing? We have, we perform with a full band. Um, so we have uh, my stepdad, Will, he's our bassist. Um, we have a keyboard player, uh, an acoustic guitarist, drummer, my brother-in-law is our drummer. And we've had guest musicians join us. Uh, we had a saxophonist join us the year that we did. I feel good, and then <laughs> So we had a saxophonist. And in fact, we have one of our choir members is a flautist. So before her stroke, she was a professional flute player. Um, she had her stroke, developed right-sided paralysis, can't play her flute anymore. But just like the man I mentioned who has the adapted guitar, she connected with a mechanical engineer who devised a way for her to play her flute with one hand. So she has agreed, maybe, almost, to um, play her flute in our next concert. I'll just share a little, a little teaser. On the song list this year is, um, here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it. No, oh no, don't worry. I'll be happy. Now there's a part that goes, do, 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 do. So we're hopeful she's going to play her flute. Um, we'll see. Wonderful questions. I appreciate your interest. Any final questions before we wrap up today? All right. Well, do feel free to reach out afterward. Please grab a business card if you'd like. Please sign up if you'd like to, to know when we're performing. And again, thank you. Thank you, John Newton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.